Today we're going to talk about scarring. There's all different types of scarring. There are atrophic scars, hypertrophic scars, normal healing scars, and keloids. I'm going to focus my attention on two types of scars, which are hypertrophic versus keloid scars. And I want you to think about these two types of scars as being too much, too big, compared to a scar that heals flat, a, a scar that may have different colors, or a scar that may be depressed. The depressed scar will be atrophic. So on one spectrum, you've got atrophic scars, you've got sort of flat scars, which is obviously the ideal, and you've got raised scars. So in terms of raised scars, there are two categories, hypertrophic scars and keloids. What's interesting with this is that these two are very distinct types of scars. I've heard so many times, on the order of maybe hundreds of times uh, over the last 20 years of practice, someone coming in saying they have a keloid. And because this term has been associated with all types of thickened scars, we oftentimes will say, I have a keloid or you have a keloid, when really what you're referring to is a hypertrophic scar. Why is this distinction important? Well, first of all, these two scars are absolutely very different and the treatment is very different. They appear different, they have different clinical courses, and they ultimately have a different type of treatment. So what is the distinction? So we'll first start with how they appear grossly. A hypertrophic scar is a raised scar that does not go well beyond the borders of the, the, scar, of the, of the actual individual scar. So it's like a, a raised ridge. A keloid goes way beyond the border. So what looks like just a raised area actually goes maybe three times the size or two times the size, sometimes 20 times the size. So it's a much larger scar in terms of a keloid scar. So size matters when, it, uh, when we're comparing these two types. The second distinction is a histologic one. Histo histology means a tissue. So if you took a biopsy or if you sent it for a pathologic specimen or sample, you're gonna see that a hypertrophic scar has organized collagen bundles, whereas a, um, a keloid has disorganized collagen bundles. And finally, the most important aspect is that the treatment and the, um, as well as the clinical course are very, very different. So with a keloid scar, if you just cut a keloid scar out and you say, well, I'm done, and you say bye-bye, that keloid scar, you actually anger it. That keloid scar will be several times the size. Sometimes it just doesn't even stop growing. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It can look like a football in the neck. You've seen it in African-Americans with a big, uh, looks like an earring, but it's actually a keloid. So these scars go well beyond the confines of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a hypertrophic scar. And their clinical course is very unique because that scar just pro progressively gets worse and worse and it needs to be managed very, very differently. With a hypertrophic scar, oftentimes over time, it either doesn't get better or it may slightly soften over time, and the treatment is radically different. So, <clears throat> first of all, <coughs> where do keloid scars occur? Keloid scars occur usually outside of the face, uh, along the neck, lateral jawline, ears, scalp, back of heads, and body. They rarely, if ever, occur in the central face. Um, whereas hypertrophic scars can occur anywhere on the face, including the middle of the face. The reason why this is, is that keloids, first of all, we have a lot more oil glands in the center part of our face, so keloids are something that, generally speaking, doesn't occur in that central portion of our face. It occurs, again, lateral to the jawline out there where the, the oil glands are different, so that keloids are more prone to occur. Keloids uh, are more prone to occur in certain ethnicities. The classic example is African Americans, but they also occur in all ethnicities. They can even occur in Caucasians. So just because you're not black doesn't mean you won't get a keloid. But people that are prone to keloids are prone to get those keloids uh, again and again in different areas. And those that are very severe have, can have very disfiguring keloids that are all over the body. The way we treat keloids is very different the way that we treat hypertrophic scars. So a keloid, what I found is, if, is, as I said earlier, if you cut out that keloid and close it, you're going to have a worse result. You cannot do that. I've also found that steroid injections for keloids 
generally speaking fail. If you have a large keloid, it's gonna get a little better, but it really doesn't fix it. What you've gotta do is, in my opinion, you've gotta surgically cut it out, bring it down to a very small uh, degree, and then you've gotta undergo timed radiation. In the old days, only a few years ago, I would say it had to be done within 24 hours. Now the thinking is it has to be done within 48 to 72 hours. So there's a little bit more of a, a lead time. But I never schedule a keloid until we have timed radiation. Radiation is a vital component to make that success rate down from zero. I think it's not only will you not have success rate with a keloid, just cutting it out, but you'll actually have magnification and worsening you've got to have time radiation. So I won't even schedule an appointment for a keloid unless that person also has an appointment for radiation time. Usually that low dose radiation occurs over three to five days depending on the protocol being used. There are various different protocols, but it's low dose radiation that's being used in that area. It's such low dose that if it recurred, you could have radiation again in that same area if it needed it. Um, and I don't believe a keloid is successful until you've re at least reached five years out, even though I would say after one year, the success rate is very, very high. If you do excision plus time radiation, the success rate is quite high. I would say it's over 90%. And it, to get to one year, it pushes you probably to 95. I don't consider a victory until we hit five years, but that's, that means there's probably very less low likelihood, but again, you could have it somewhere else. So if you pierced your ear and you had a problem, don't pierce it again because you're going to have the same problem occur. Then I've got to manage it surgically plus the time radiation. The, if we're dealing with a recurrence of a keloid, how do you manage it? Then for me, pressure is important, so pressure clips and various things before it becomes a problem, in which case at that point, then I can do um, a, I don't, I'm trying to save you from a second surgery, in which case I would inject steroids um, or have a local provider inject steroids into it as soon as you can if it's starting to recur. That way, if we catch it early, we don't necessarily need to do more surgery, but once it becomes big, surgery is the way to do it. The way that I inject a, a keloid is I use a 50-50 mix, 50%, 50% of uh, triamcinolone 40 milligrams per milliliter, so it's a much higher dose, triamcinolone 40 milligrams per milliliter, with 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. 5-FU I've been using since 2007, I'm shooting this video now in 2023, so this is 16 years since I've been using this product very safely. Um, but 5-FU diluted with uh, Kenalog 40 milligrams per milliliter in a one-to-one -one ratio is how I manage early recurrence of keloids. Again, it's not going to work in a big scar. And I'm putting that, you must place that intra-scar. If you go below the scar, you can have dermal atrophy or problems with uh, loss of that tissue for six months or more. Hypertrophic scars on the other side are, again, what the vast majority of people have out there. Those are the scars that are just a little bit thickened. And those are the ones that people claim are keloids when they're really not. If that scar uh, is not tender, itchy, and getting worse and way, well beyond the zones of the confines of the scar itself, most likely you're dealing with a hypertrophic scar. What's interesting with hypertrophic scars is that they oftentimes occur worse on body plastic surgery, which is lucky for me since I don't do body work and I don't even take moles off on the body. There's a good saying is that if you have a pretty young lady that has a little mole on the middle chest, don't take it out because that is actually gonna turn into a hypertrophic scar. So you don't wanna remove uh, moles in the middle of the chest, even someone that's not prone toward bad scarring, it's an area that will probably scar. Unless it's a cancer, obviously, don't cut out moles in the middle of the chest, but I only do body uh, in, the, in the face. Um, and so hypertrophic scars are just thicker scars. They're just a little bit beyond what that's, that original scar is and they're, they're elevated. Um, how do you manage these scars? So I use a combination of therapies. If the scar is just slightly elevated, my safest method, I'll explain what safety means more in depth in a moment, is Botox. Botox can manage discolorations, maybe not on the first pass, um, it can manage a uh, thickening, it can manage quality of skin, everything. And, and listen to my video, where I'm not gonna go in depth in this video called Botox for Scarring, where I go into deep uh, analysis of the studies that have been shown, my experience levels of, with Botox for Scarring. But Botox for Scarring is very safe and very powerful. The one negative of Botox, if I'm doing it near the mouth area, is temporary for about six weeks, two months of the smile maybe being a little off. It's not very high um, odds of that and it's all temporary because if it's a small area, the odds are not very high. But 
you just need to know that so that you don't think anything was a, a problem. The reason why I think Botox is so safe is that there really hasn't, except for bruising um, temporarily, it doesn't really cause a dermal atrophy risk, it doesn't cause issues with uh, pigmentation changes except for bruising. Um, and so very, very safe long term. And it's very, very effective for the molecular healing of the tissues. And I do that oftentimes for hypertrophic scars. Keloids, again, it's, an under, it's not strong enough to do it. I oftentimes will also use 5-fluorouracil with uh, Kenalog or Triamcinolone, 10 milligrams per milliliter in a ratio of about 1 to 4. So I will use like 0.1 of, example, uh, of Kenalog 10 or Triamcinolone, 10 milligrams per milliliter with a ratio of like maybe like 0.4, for example, of the 5-fluorouracil uh, mixture. The combination is very, very effective in scars because I really want to limit the risk of dermal atrophy, which again is temporary, but it can last many, many months. Temp dermal atrophy means the tissues you get sunken, so you have to place it exactly perfectly into that tissue. Uh, I want to contrast that with what I just mentioned for keloid so you understand the distinction. A keloid, I'm using triamcinolone, 40 milligrams per milliliter, and in a hypertrophic scar, I'm using triamcinolone, 10 milligrams per milliliter, so 40 versus 10. And I'm mixing for a, a keloid one-to-one -one ratio, so 50-50 mix. And it, you know, it depends on how big the keloid is. Of course, I'm treating small ones because when it becomes big, I really think you need surgery. So I may mix 0 0.5, 0 0.5 for a keloid, whereas I'm mixing uh, 0.2 plus 0.8 of, uh, of the uh, five, uh, sorry, uh, triamcinolone, 10 milligrams per cc with uh, the five fluorouracil. So I'm doing a one to four ratio where it's four parts, five four fluorouracil, five FU, and one part uh, K10. The other one I'm doing a 50-50 max keloids with K40 with the uh, with five FU. The, um, the reason I use 5-FU in 5-fluorouracil is a, you'll see it on the bottle, it's really for intravenous use for cancer, it's not going to cause cancer, but it is used to treat cancer, it's a, it's a chemotherapy agent, but it's incredibly effective on scar tissues, and again, I've been using it for 16 years with no adverse long-term risk, but there are some risks with it. So I use it to dilute my steroid and also effectively manage the scar tissue. I will use that um, amount, very small amount, usually with a 30 gauge needle placed into the scar to minimize dermal atrophy. The uh, benefit is within a few weeks you'll see an improvement. The risk of 5-FU, if it, so if it's placed too deeply you can still get dermal atrophy so it's got to be placed with a skilled injector. The second thing is that um, what I've noticed with 5-FU is a temporary discoloration, sometimes especially in darker patients, Hispanics, um, some darker Asians, even just Asians, uh, dark Mediterraneans, Africans, they can get a violaceous color, violaceous is a fancy medical word to describe a purple discoloration to the skin. That uh, lasts a few months sometimes, it's not always common. The deeper the scar, the less chance, the more superficial that injection, the higher chance. It is temporary, but that is a sort of a longer term thing that people may be um, worried about. But it's a way for me still to get a safer um, reduction of the scar instead of using, instead of using uh, straight steroids. I, I almost never use straight steroids because of the risk of dermal atrophy um, in that area. When would I use Botox? When would I use 5-FU? So Botox, if it's minimally elevated, it works really well. If it's a big, thick scar, I may go to 5-FU as my workhorse. So it really is a judgment issue. Uh, sometimes I'll alternate with them every three weeks. I don't want to do a scar dissolve more than every three to six weeks, and Botox I usually don't do for um, every three months or so. Oftentimes I'll get results very quickly with one or the other, and sometimes, I'll, as I said, I'll do one and then do the other one. And of course, Botox, you're waiting a longer interval at three months to do it again. But in general, I, I do one or the other for it. Um, I don't take insurance. I do charge cash for whatever I'm injecting, but it's not that expensive for me to do it. I do all my own injections myself because it's got to be placed in the right depth. Uh, and that's really, really important. Uh, I'm hoping, in, in, on average, I'm doing one to five treatments to get your scar as good as possible with Botox or with um, with the 5 4 year so and K10 combination. I will also, also sometimes use KTP laser. KTP laser works on redness and also helps modulate the scar tissue. It's a 532 nanometer laser I've been doing for many years. Very minimal discomfort, really doesn't 
burn the skin or cause any issues. Uh, the other thing you can do for hypertrophic scars, I think keloids are not going to work as well, so is silicone. I use silicone gels, silicone sheeting. That can also help modulate scar tissues. Silicone gel, uh, as a financial um, thing, I do make Scar Smart off Amazon. It's something that I do make myself. Um, and uh, would, 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 it's, to me, it's a very high grade silicone. You can use sheets in areas of uh, higher mobility. Like I find that the sheets in the lower face to oftentimes falls off. Uh, and the gels are a little bit easier to stay on. The sheets do work better towards scar, scar modulation, so in areas of lower mobility, that can work very well. The other thing that I do for areas like in the forehead, if there's a scar in the forehead, is I won't only just do that dilute Botox I'm injecting into the zone, but I'll do a concentrated Botox over the for, full head. I've done some short TikTok videos about that showing some power with one treatment. And I've found that what that is doing is, is limiting the stretch back, but it's also creating a collagen remodeling that's very, very powerful. Uh, RF microneedle can help more on the atrophic scar side. I usually don't use it for major um, a, uh, hypertrophic scars because I don't want to stimulate the scar tissue. I know people have done it with success, but if I've got something with a hypertrophic scar level, I'd rather use something to quiet it down rather than something to stimulate the collagen. Uh, this is the, uh, these are just general concepts between hypertrophic and keloid scars. Hopefully this video is helpful for you if you have one or the other and also especially to make a delineation.